Chapter 4, Human Resource Management. An important thing to note in this chapter is when dealing with personnel, personnel is the most important resource available to any fire and emergency service organization. And often, in my opinion, it's the one that we take care of the least. We don't do enough to take care of our people. We'll spend all kind of money on repairing apparatus and maintenance on them, but we spend very little on our most valuable resource, human resources. So when we're going through this chapter, keep an open mind and think about the problems that you have dealt with in the past with supervisors and what would have made them go better or you know what would have done worse uh, what were some good human resource relations you had and what were some not so good and kind of use that as a frame when deciding the best way to deal with stuff and in this chapter we're going to go over some basic things to kind of think about and some ideas to help you become a supervisor in dealing with human resource issues and as a new lieutenant, you are now middle management, so you're going to be faced with all kind of new and exciting human resource issues from evaluations to disciplinary actions to writing appraisals to proving time off and dealing with personal issues because you know remember a lot of times these folks are off for 24 hours so the problems they have at home tend to visit and come to work from time to time so let's go ahead and dive in and get started objective number one recognize planning processes as they relate to human resource management The planning model listed here provides a systematic approach to decision making. This approach is a five step process. Step one, identify. Identify a problem that requires a response, the problem which may be an emergency situation or a non-emergency incident. Step two, Select. Choose the appropriate response to the problem according to the desired goals, outcomes, and objectives. Step 3. Design. Determine the steps required to meet the selected goals, outcomes, and objectives. Step 4. Implement. Perform the selected activity or supervise crew members in the activity that will mitigate the problem. And finally, step five, evaluate. Determine the effectiveness of the activities in meeting the goals or outcomes. Effectiveness may be immediate, such as successful extrication of a victim, or it may be prolonged, such as the improved relationships of crew members. Now it's important to note that evaluation may indicate the need for some changes in the activities. When changes are identified, a new analysis is used to begin the cycle again. Company officers must prioritize their workloads and administrative activities to accomplish the goals that they are assigned. They must plan effectively, which should improve with practice. Examples of company level planning can include the following. Task and activities, pre-instant planning, company level training, and company level inspections. And as a new officer, it's going to be up to you to do this juggling act and make plans and get all these tasks accomplished. Unfortunately, what do they say about plans? The best laid plans of mice men are, are, are laid to waste at times, whether it be the uh, call to the bullpen, so to speak, from a battalion chief or a captain, uh, some training or public service, something or another that popped up out of the blue, or even, say, uh, emergency calls. So, 
sometimes you have to alter your plan. So when a company officer encounters a situation where established organizational plans appear inappropriate, an immediate decision may have to be made. In this case, you should use your best judgment to formulate a plan or modify the existing one. To make a recommendation for modification, the company officer should, of course, document the situation description, recommended alterations, justifications for the recommendations, and prolonged outcome of the alteration. And, you know, this just depends on if it's something that you've been tasked with from the higher-ups and you're going to be a little delinquent or late getting it done, well, you know, keep a logbook. That's what I tell everyone. You know, when you first get the reins, keep a logbook on what happens on a daily basis and, you know, a little time frame. That way you can go back and kind of justify, well, yeah, the pre-plans aren't done yet because you had us doing this uh, public service event on this day, from this time to this time, we ran five calls, truck broke down, or whatever the case may be. Okay, so moving on. Quick review. What are the five steps in the planning process? Step one, identify. Step two, select. Step three, design. Step four, implement. And step five, evaluate. Okay, you do have a activity this week and it's listed in your assignments, but you need to organize the completion of a departmental task. And if you look in the folder under lessons uh, for this week, you will see it obviously, and go ahead and fill that out and put it in the drop box and turn it in. Learning objective number two, list human resources organizational policies that a company officer is responsible for. So when we're looking at organizational policies, the company officer will have direct involvement with their assigned personnel and should have knowledge of the following policies. Duty assignments, promotions, retention, performance evaluation, shift swap, leave, substance abuse, and absenteeism. So let's look at first duty assignment first. Once the first assignment given company officer begins, they need to train new employees according to local policies. And this requires, you know, mentoring, socializing them into the department culture. And the initial introduction should be as smooth as possible. Now, that initial impression can go a long way with that individual and affects their development, their motivation, and even their retention with the department. Now the company officer is responsible for establishing work assignments for new personnel, explaining tasks to perform at emergency incidences. Remember, new employees must be told tasks that they will perform at every emergency incident. Practice the incident task with other crew members who serve as mentors. That way they can be proficient and comfortable when the time comes. Remember, they're fresh out of recruit school. They've been taught basic hands-on, and as I said, just enough to get themselves into trouble. Um, they haven't really been put to the real-world test yet, so you're going to need to take time and mentor them. Remember, new employees also need to learn duties and tasks required in non-emergency activities. And this can include cleaning apparatus, cleaning the facility, standing radio watch, and interacting with external customers, such as, you know, answering the telephone at the station. A lot of times in this day and age, new employees, you may need to educate them with the younger generation on, hey, you know what, your mother doesn't live here and this is how the uh, washing machine works or dishwasher uh, push mower, uh, things of that nature, or chainsaw. So don't be as surprised if you get a, a puzzled look on their face when they ask you to do something. And sometimes it does take a minute to uh, 
step back and explain what you think is common sense. But that's okay, because, you know, that's your job. Tell them what you expect, show them how it's supposed to be done, and then check and make sure it's done. Now, understand that some training can be delegated to other members of the company. For example, apparatus care and cleaning can be delegated to the driver operator to train. Maybe a senior EMT or paramedic to help them with the responsibilities on an EMS call. It's always a good idea to assign experienced crew members as a mentor to the new employee. And this helps ensure that knowledge is passed on and it provides a personal instruction and encouragement to that new employee. Any activity should be documented. Organizations can use a sign off our task book to monitor and account for training. And I always find that during a probationary period, it's a good idea with a training division or not to have a task book. And this task book is basically a review of common things that, of course, they learned in recruit school and some other things that they may not have that you feel is important to make sure that you cover with them. And anytime a task is done and you verify it, you sign off on it. And of course, the employee signs off on it. And now you've got a record that they've been trained on that topic. So it can be something as simple as, you know, organizational policies and procedures for shift swap to um, deploying a roof ladder. But I do think uh, during this probationary period and the mentor uh, had this task book. That way you have that running record of, of what's going on. Now, your probationary periods vary from department to department. It can be anywhere from six, three months, six months to even 18 months. And a lot of that also has to do with the fact on, you know, whether or not uh, they go to, you know, firefighter recruit school for, say, uh, you know, 14 weeks, 12 weeks, and EMT school for another, you know, 12, 16, 18 weeks. So if you think about it, you're really losing about six months to, you know, possibly a year before these people even see uh, the light of day in terms of a fire station. So that's why a lot of departments have these longer probationary periods. So this probationary period allows the organization to evaluate the employee's ability to fulfill job requirements. And the company officer, you, are going to be responsible for managing and evaluation this process. Probationary employees who not successfully complete training or unable to meet minimum job requirements may be terminated or demoted and, like, say, uh, sent back to recruit school. So you, the supervisor, will provide guidance while observing, evaluating performance against an established standard policy and procedure. When you're doing this, it's always a good idea to keep track of specific incidences. And again, keep notes because at some point you're going to have to do an evaluation on this individual. And it may be very hard to document and justify, you know, really great marks or really low marks if you don't have specific incidences and things to reference. One of the first things you should do with this new employee is lay out your expectations. What do you expect from them? Or, uh, you know, as my battalion chief, uh, when I was a brand new firefighter uh, coming on duty, uh, took me for a walkabout. And, you know, that was, you know, for my years only, and I'm walking around the station, and he laid out his expectations on what he expected quote from his boys and these were like the unwritten rules of the department that he expected you to follow and I clearly remember one of them was be there 30 minutes earlier than shift change so let's say duty shift change started at seven o'clock he expected everyone to be ready to go at 6 30 and that was just one of his uh, things and he had some other uh, you know, funny little things like, you know, make sure that there's always tea made and have dinner on the table by 5 o'clock. But um, as a new company officer, lay out 
what you expect, you know. Here are your signs, station duties that I want you to do. Uh, this is what I want you to do on emergency scene. This is the time I want you here. Um, you know, be a team member. Play attention to details. Follow through with assignments. Respect authority. Take personal responsibility. Uh, maintain response, uh, positive attitude, and, and you know, respect the confidentiality of the patient. Or um, people we serve so that's just a, a list uh, of general things but explain the expectations in clear and concise terms and it's also a good idea to provide them in written form when you do that seek feedback from them to make sure they understand what you are saying. Not that they just nod their head. Everybody nods their head, you know, like, especially being the new person, like, I may not have a clue what you're saying. I'm the new guy. Uh, I don't want to cause waves. I don't want to bring issues to myself. You know, they may be totally clueless, but they're going to say, yes, they understand. You know, and another great thing to be as a, a new leader over a new employee is be familiar with the employee's situation. Know about their background. Provide support to them. And this may be uh, talking to, you know, the training captain or lieutenant that ran their recruit school. Find out a little bit about this new person before they get there. Uh, what are they like? Where were they a little weak in school? What did they excel at? And kind of have an idea uh, what you're dealing with before they walk in to the station. Okay, so here's all the things we just listed. I apologize, got a little ahead of the slides. But uh, here are some guidelines for expectations you can lay out for your new employees. Establishing a professional work environment is so important to the success of a company officer. Employees must be given the opportunity to fit in and become contributing members of the unit. As the company officer, you should help to create this environment that fosters teamwork, communication, and diversity. Because diverse workforce may be different for some current members, change management is an important part of diversification. The company officer must ensure that the change process occurs smoothly and employees are properly assimilated into the unit. So often, a lot of times when a new officer is promoted, you know, you're put with a new company or a new group. That way you're not supervising, um, you know, your peers, so to speak, that uh, you've kind of grown up with. So this makes it a little easier to be the boss is what they're getting at. So the company officer does have the responsibility also to ensure that the work location environment is beneficial for all employees. A favorable work environment includes compliance with organizational policies, practices, procedures, and of course, the law. An unfavorable work environment occurs when employees in a workplace are subjected to a pattern of offensive conduct or behavior such as sexual harassment or hazing. The condition is further aggravated if the supervisor or manager takes no steps to discourage or discontinue such behavior. Policies are established to protect all employees from this hostile abuse, and the company officer should be familiar with the organizational guidelines that deal with these issues. So we all know, especially if you've been in the fire service in length of time, that you know a lot of times call volume goes down. Then, of course, accidents and pranks seem to go up because uh, the firefighters have too much time on their hands. And you know some jokes are, are okay if they're tasteful, but others are just uncalled for. And I can remember uh, growing up in the fire service where. You know, the, the pranks would get so bad, you would like lock yourself in the rig or the ambulance and sleep at night because you couldn't sleep in your bed because they would mess with your sheets, the, the bed was up on tilts, you'd have, you know, water dripping from the ceiling, um, all, all kind of just, uh, you know, not very nice things. 
So this really creates that hostile work environment. And, you know, you don't need to condone this. You as the officer need to put an end to it. And you can even look and Google it if you're not familiar with it. Uh, the uh, Macon Fire Department, where uh, some supervisors were written up for participating in a, in a like an initiation or a prank on some rookie firefighters, some new firefighters. They had a guy come in uh, off duty or from another shift, wave a gun around, uh, you know, toss you know people on the floor. Um, they took one of them that was in on the kind of a, the joke and pulled him to a back room and shot off a blank. So they actually thought someone got shot. So, you know, that's going to the extreme. And, of course, the company officers were in the video watching it. And then, you know, they, they posted on YouTube for everyone to see. And you can just imagine where that went from there. Sexual harassment involves both a hostile work environment and attempts by supervisor to use the power to gain sexual favors from employees. Company officers may have to deal with a situation involving a coworker. Failure to follow proper procedures can have serious legal repercussions on both the officer and the organization as a whole. So, company officers must know and understand some of the following. Laws that govern the workplace behavior, behavior that constitutes sexual harassment, local reporting processes for sexual harassment, employees' rights in such cases, eliminating an unfavorable environment and preventing sexual harassment are the responsibility, of course, of all members within an organization. The company officer must monitor all their own activities as well of those of members within the unit. So you need to ensure that the organization's sexual harassment policy is clearly stated to all employees and posted in a visible location in the station. Be aware of the warning signs that sexual harassment is occurring. Take corrective action immediately and decisively. Inform employees who are engaging in inappropriate behavior that it is an infraction of the organization's policy and will not be tolerated. Inform your superiors, and I can't stress this enough, document all information regarding the incident and attempts to resolve the behavior. Request additional or remedial training in the organization's policy regarding sexual harassment or hostile uh, work environment may be an option. Of course, the company officer does have a role in the promotion and retention of subordinates. It's important for the company officer to take interest in the career choices of their subordinates and help the subordinate investigate and prepare for the advancement. They should be able to provide promotional information on the types of courses uh, in terms of training classes and, and certifications that would be helpful to that individual. And as I said earlier, in the fire service, our most important asset is you, the employee. So, as an officer, it is important for you to help with retention of the employees. And I've often said that an employee will put up with excellent pay and a crappy work environment. Or they'll put up with crappy pay and a great work environment but they will not put up with both. And if they do, it won't be for very long. Now, granted, we don't have a lot of control as a company officer over their pay. Um, you know, you may pay a, a little bit to it in terms of evaluations that we'll cover here in a minute. 
So that's really kind of, you know, out of our realm of control. So what you can do is invest in the employee by ensuring they have that great work environment and helping them advance and do better. Okay, as I said a minute ago, evaluations are, are definitely a part of the job. They can be formal or informal. They can be oral or written. They can be impromptu, you know, spur of the moment, or during daily activities. They can be used as a coaching or counseling when behaviors warrant it. Your formal evaluation is generally written in nature, and it's something that's scheduled annually or semi-annually, so every six months, three months, a year, at the end of probationary periods, or whatever the case. And they can also occur uh, before a promotional exam, or it can be done when some sort of improper behavior has uh, not improved through the informal evaluation process. Of course, NFPA 21 states that formal evaluations are the duty of a level two fire officer, but in many cases, these evaluations are done in a lot of departments here at the fire officer one or lieutenant level because you are the person that works with these people on a daily basis. And a lot of times you have four people assigned to an engine company. So you're responsible for doing the evaluations of the three people underneath you. And then of course the captain or battalion chief may handle uh, your evaluation. So when you're doing these evaluations, as I said, uh, for that probationary period, make sure that you keep a log on certain things to help justify those marks, whether they be, you know, excellently good or extremely bad, you want to, oh, excuse me, have something to write down. And I promise you, listen to me on this. I'm talking from experience. There is no worse feeling in the world than sitting down at the computer trying to think, okay, what happened this past year to put down on an evaluation? Uh, you're usually stuck with a lot of meat standards. That way you don't have to justify a lot. And that's not really fair to the organization or the employee. All right, so the next thing to talk about, of course, is leave and duty exchange. And what I mean by leave, of course, is vacation, sick time, comp time, whatever the case may be. And... Sometimes, you as a company officer may have the authority to approve these leave times. You should ensure that there is, of course, enough leave uh, for them accrued to take, and that it's not going to affect staffing levels. So, you know, you need to be familiar with the reasons to, of course, grant PTO, personal time off, or reasons to deny it, such as, you know, we're only allowed, you know, one person off per shift or two or three or whatever the case may be, and uh, there's already that many off. So insufficient staffing, or maybe it's some sort of mandated training. So, hey, you know, I'm going to deny this because we're doing this, you know, training that has to be done and we're not reduplicating it. Or, okay, yeah, you can be off, but it's your responsibility to get this mandatory training and come in off duty or something of that nature on another shift. Another policy that's very popular and, and one that you should be familiar with is shift trade or duty exchange. And many organizations allow the employees of similar rank in training to exchange shifts. Not so much uh, with, you know, going up a level, uh, but that just depends on your organization. And it's important to note that I did read an article on this very subject in terms of shift exchange. It was a case where an employee swapped with another employee and owe them like say two or three or four shifts. I, I don't remember the entire block of time. Well, that employee that owed the shift time resigned their position with the department and wouldn't pay back the individual that swamped with them. You know, they said, oh, I can't, blah, blah, blah. 
So when that individual left the department, the employee that worked for him ended up suing them and taking them to civil court for that amount of hours, like 24 hours, 48 hours, 72, at the prescribed pay rate, saying that he had it in writing where this person agreed to work for him. Uh, that person did not. They now have left the department, so they're you know on hook for this time. And wouldn't you know that the judge sided with that employee and put in a judgment for a monetary value for those shifts that that person owed him. So uh, be familiar with the leave and duty exchange, uh, and you never know when you're signing these things um, what's going to come up. So make sure you always pay individuals back. Another policy to be familiar with is the Employee Assistance Program. And this is designed to help employees deal with stress. Because stress can affect the work environment, their health, and their well-being. And this employee assistance program provides a referral service for employees that are in need of some sort of counseling or assistance. And some employees have it, employers have it, some don't, but most do nowadays. And it's always important to know what that number is. And don't just say, okay, it's over on the bulletin board, because I promise you, when you need it, you won't be anywhere near the bulletin board. Go ahead and put it in your cell phone or have a few cards in your wallet or something that you're going to keep on you. That way you, you'll have it when the need arises. So the stress may be enhanced by other certain significant events during an emergency. And this stress or the calls can cause employees to become dependent on tobacco, alcohol, drugs, um, domestic violence, maybe excessive gambling or some sort of financial difficulties. Uh, it may be some sort of significant event that triggers it, such as a death of a colleague, a death of a, a, a child, uh, some sort of uh, neglect or suffering of an elderly, or some other high-profile events. And as a company officer, you need to note when these events happen and be able to look at your employees and pick up on signs and symptoms of excessive stress. Now, some of them can be really simple, such as you know, increased heart rate and blood pressure, increased oxygen consumption. Uh, they can be very tense and straining. They may have dilated pupils. They may have difficulty concentrating or staying focused. They may have um, temporary loss of short-term memory, loss of mental flexibility, uh, obsessive thoughts, or they may become withdrawn or isolated. Uh, they can have invulnerable feelings. They can have lots of wishful thinking or fantasy. Or, you know, they may just put everything on autopilot and uh, just, you know, be cruising around. They're not focusing, they're just going through the motions. Of course, uh, they may start experiencing abuse of drugs and alcohol, and that's something that you need to be mindful of and look for. And they may have problems sleeping, such as insomnia or, or you know, fatigue during the day. And often you can pick up on these. If you work for with someone any length of time, just like a spouse or a child, you can pick up on when they're not their self. Now, I'm not telling you to be their counselor because that's not your job in a sense of, of providing psychological counseling. However, it is your job to make sure that they get the resources they need before these issues become a problem and can cause somebody to get hurt or injured or even killed. So let's look at substance abuse. Now this includes the improper use of alcohol, drugs, uh, impaired judgment, and slow reaction time. And it does seem that members in public safety tend to have a problem uh, with alcoholism as a whole, if you look at industry trends and 
and surveys that are out there. Of course, the effects are not only to the individual, but also those who work and live with that individual and, of course, the public. Um, it does make you wonder about um, the stress that these are under in terms of the public. Uh, there was a case in uh, Dunwoody, city of Dunwoody in DeKalb County, uh, quite recently about an EMT that worked for an ambulance company that uh, had a patient in the back of their ambulance that was restrained, you know, handcuffed, and this person spit on the EMT, and the EMT proceeded to um, hit the person that spit on him. And, of course, that was called on the body camera of the police officer on scene, and that EMT was arrested and charged with uh, assault and battery, and of course lost their job over it. So, you know, makes you wonder, was there certain stressors that led up to that point to push that person over the edge to take it out on, you know, a, a psych patient, uh, a member of the public? It is important to note that symptoms of substance abuse will vary depending on the type of substance, and one symptom may not be enough to indicate abuse. However, they can suggest there may be a problem brewing. So the company officer should be aware of the symptoms and root causes for substance abuse. And when they're noted and they come up, you need to make sure you refer the subordinate to the appropriate employee assistance program. Absenteeism. Now, this may indicate a serious problem, or it can be a circumstance beyond the employee's control, um, such as a sick spouse. Uh, maybe the, the spouse has cancer, or breast cancer, or a sick child, and they're you know, burning the candles at both ends. They've got to be at home and take care of them, but bills are piling up. So this absenteeism could really signify a significant problem for them. Uh, a stressful environment, even though they're not under any kind of like substance abuse, they're under tremendous stress, and that's something that you need to try to help them with, whether it be, again, uh, referring to EAP, or maybe you have a, um, a department policy where individuals can donate excessive vacation time to that individual um, that's going through this uh, unforeseen hardship. So when these absenteeism start to happen, the company officer should first gather all the information that they can about the incident through communication with the employee. Find out whether the, you know, the absentee was due to illness or maybe weather or maybe they were out of town and you know missed a flight or whatever the case may be. Of course, you would hope that they would call and let you know that uh, beforehand. As always, you need to counsel the employee on the importance of contacting the supervisor when they're going to be late. And uh, departments I've worked for in the past had a basic thing saying, okay, if you're going to be late, you need to notify us 30 minutes prior to your shift starting. And of course, that was in reason. I mean, I guess if you got a wreck on the way uh, within 30 minutes, you wouldn't be able to call. But uh, that was kind of the policy because their thought was, hey, if you're going to be late, you know you're going to be late uh, prior to your, your shift being start and you need to let us know so we can make arrangements so your shift can be covered. Now, if the absenteeism is to do some personal problem, as I said, refer them to EAP. And if the situation can't be resolved by uh, the EAP individuals, the company officer may have to recommend some form of discipline. But the most important thing is to keep a paper trail. Trust me on this. Keep a paper trail on everything that was said, document, done, and did. Uh, so heaven forbid, uh, if it comes to termination, or to that point, you've got the justification written down. Or again, if they want to terminate this individual and the person's really trying and really doing good and jump through these hoops, well, you can show, hey, um, you know, you can go to bad form and saying, hey, this is what's, you know, been going on and this is what they've done. Let, let's give them another shot because they're really a good employee.
Learning objective number three, explain the role of the company officer in behavior management. Conflict management. Management styles are based on concern for other parties and oneself. Concerns result in three types of behavior. Passive, which is non-aggressive, hide one's own emotion. The goal here is to appease others and avoid conflict. Next is aggressive, which they express emotion openly, use threatening behavior, results in violation of others' rights. Their goal is to dominate the situation and win with force and, and cause the other people to lose. Assertive personality. They express the emotion honestly. They defend the rights without hurting others. The goal here is communication and mutual respect, fair play, and compromise. The personal rights of others are not violated, though feelings, beliefs of individual express in honest and appropriate manner. So now let's look at with these personalities methods to resolve conflict. So methods of resolving conflict. First, avoiding, which is a non-assertive passive approach. Basically, this is the let's stick the head in the sand and deny the problem exists. Refuse to take stand on the situation and mentally and physically withdraw from the situation. Um, this often results in lose-lose situations and conflict not being resolved. Accommodating, which basically appeases the others by passively giving in to positions. The result in a lose-win situation. One person needs are met at the expense of others. Forcing which is relying on aggressive, uncooperative approach. The result is win-lose situation. And unfortunately, when you force someone to do something, you may get it done, but it can damage the relationship, create animosity, and be a single solution response to problems. Um, Meaning, well, you know what, in the future, this is the only way to get it done, so I'm just going to have to, you know, be the boss. And that's not, not going to work out sometimes. You know, be the whatever. Next, we have negotiation. And this is reaching a compromise solution that all parties can agree upon. Now, with this, the supervisor, traditionally you, acts as a moderator. This results in a decision causing everyone to compromise on something um, and benefit from other things. This is usually a good way to resolve issues, especially personnel issues between two individuals. So the conflict gets resolved quickly and the relationships are, are maintained. So everybody gets to say their piece, so to speak, and they come to agreement and, and things are all buddy-buddy. Uh, uh, collaborating, which is uh, sharing information openly and honestly, usually results in the best solution. It focuses on the best interests of the organization and the community and the service area. So it's very similar to negotiation except collaboration. Uh, the thought or the premise is um, organization wins, where negotiation, you know, everybody gives up something and, and comes away happy, but they don't get everything they want. So our steps to resolve conflict. Of course, it's always best to resolve conflict as soon as it occurs. Decision-making process can be used as a basis for managing conflict with the similar guiding principles. Uh, first, you need to separate your involved parties from the issue, whether it be send somebody home, send them to separate corners, whatever the case may be. 
and then focus on the common interest. So our step one here again is classify, identify the problem. Step two, define and diagnose. Step three, determine the response appropriate to the conflict. Step four, determine other options. Step five, take action. And step six, test the action against the desired outcome. Now, if a conflict cannot be resolved internally, certain issues may arise, such as loss of that team unity, transfer personnel, and even worse, uh, legal confrontations. Now, peer mediation is one of the most effective internal conflict or dispute resolution processes. And with that, the conflicting parties appear before a team of employees trained in the mediation process. The benefits of peer mediation is relations are maintained, external publicity is avoided, costly litigation is avoided, organizational participants control the process, and the participants ultimately control the resolution. What are some examples you have seen of resolving conflict effectively? Unfortunately, we do have to talk about discipline because personnel may make rules and not comply with procedures. Possible reasons for personnel to break rules can be resentment, and this can be created when wages or working conditions suffer, bitter labor management disputes or um, rules that are unfairly or inconsistently applied. Boredom. Too little work, little interest in work, guess what? Uh, they're going to get in trouble. Ignorance. Lack of knowledge of job requirement rules of conduct. Stress. Personal problems on or off the job that affect performance. Now, in terms of this, I can say um, there was an issue that was dealt with where a new employee, I say new, they were still in their first year, um, was having financial troubles and was basically siphoning gas from a hydrant truck and taking gas from a lawnmower to get by. So, you know, this is a reason uh, they were breaking the rule. So they had that stress factor. And uh, the station officer caught this individual uh, doing it. Um, the individual came clean. Uh, the officer said, hey, I understand, but you know, you can't do this and ended up um, basically taking money out of the officer's own pocket and replacing the gas and the hydrant truck and the lawnmower and filling up the tank for that employee and saying, you know, don't worry about it. You know, pay me back when you can. We've all been in a pinch from time to time. So, unfortunately, several shifts later, the uh, individual was caught doing it again and unfortunately forced to be terminated. So, unfortunately, as the officer, you may be forced to discipline an employee. What is discipline? And when we talk about discipline in terms of the text, it says corrective discipline is training that corrects and educates. It is a formal process requiring appropriate documentation as required by the authority having jurisdiction. Discipline and fire and emergency services are designed to provide positive motivation. It ensures compliance with rules, regulations, standards, and procedures. It's a way to provide direction. Now, corrective actions should be progressive and lawful. And what I mean by progressive, you know, it's like a three-strike method. You know, strike one, 
a verbal reprimand strike two written in time off you know strike three termination that is what's known as progressive discipline so for each infraction uh, the penalty gets more severe now the employee's rights may be established by local state and provincial laws and it is up to you the employee um, not the employee, the supervisor to know the employee's rights in terms of uh, the merit system where they can maybe appeal or um, you know take the, the discipline to a higher court. As I said, progressive discipline begins with you know lower offenses and then gets to the more steep or formal sanctions, but should always begin with some sort of training. Now, the progressive discipline usually involves three levels of action, where the first is the preventive action, so the individual is counseled to correct the behavior or stop the offense progression. The second is a corrective action, when a violation is repeated or different, serious violation is committed. And then finally, punitive is that given notice of possible sanctions, if the paper continues or very serious offense is committed, um, you know, time to hit the road or more time off or whatever the case may be, uh, such as a formal writ per man, suspension, demotion, termination, and quite even prosecution. Now, a company officer must be aware of legal aspects of discipline and grievances that may be lodged. All discipline must meet legal requirements and individual discipline may result in the action being uh, overturned. Discipline may be administered only for violations of written policies, procedures, rules, regulations, SOP or SOGs, and verbal orders. Not every possible violation must be covered by specific written policies or regulations. Now, a grievance may be lodged by the subordinate if the company officer does not follow an agreement procedures when administering disciplinary actions and may prevent further actions against the employee on that issue. Potential issues cited in a grievance can be demotion, suspension without pay, work assignments that violate labor management laws, and the condition of work, employment that violates labor management agreement or other policies. Now, it's important to note, depending on where you're at in the, the United States, some departments have more union, others don't. So just be familiar of, do you have grievance policy and uh, follow all the, uh, the rules that are applicable. And remember that ignorance of the rules is not a defense, whether you're the supervisor or the person committing the infraction. Learning objective number four, describe labor management relations. So in the text, they talk about collective bargaining negotiations, and this is the process of an open communication between representatives of a union, organizational management, and local government bodies. After negotiations are concluded, labor management agreements is formulated, and the agreement determines working conditions, wages, and benefits. Now, as an officer, again, depending on where you're at, you may be a union member and also act to participate in negotiation processes. Officers' relations with their personnel can be helped by involvement in this negotiation process. Understanding of labor management agreements can lead to increased morale and retention among the personnel and help the company officer be more aware of the rules governing the personnel. So let's go ahead and summarize this chapter. A company officer must be able to plan for effective use of personnel, supervise new employees, and administer the human resource policies 
and apply behavioral management techniques for conflict management in discipline. Because human resource issues involve the organizational members, the company officers need to know both the human resource policies and procedures in the existing labor agreements. Company officers represent management as supervisors, but are also eligible for union membership. They must know the rights and responsibilities of both the organization and the labor union under the contractual agreements that are in effect. Company officers should have knowledge of typical contract issues and the various means available for resolving those issues and be prepared to be active participants in building cooperative relationship between labor and management in their organization. Okay gang, if you haven't already, go ahead and read chapter 4 and make sure you go ahead and get the review questions knocked out. Uh, for those that are watching this on YouTube and are not a part of it, this is just a uh, a basic lecture on chapter 4 for the ISTA company officer. This is part of Athens Technical College online fire science associate's degree program. So if anyone has any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can call me in the office at 706-357-0162. Until next time, be safe and have a great shift.